Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, how the heck are you? I don't think you're going to be hearing this until May or June of some time. It's kind of nice. Jen and I have gotten ahead in our recording, so I wasn't, I didn't take a look to see when this is going to be airing, but we're kind of heading into the end of the school year, early summer. How are you doing? How are you managing? I can tell you that when I'm recording this in April, what I'm seeing is people are really struggling with their mental health. It's just a hard time, and we've been doing this stuff for a long time. So if you're having a hard time, I'm really sorry. If there's anything I can do, please let me know. I'm not really sure what I want to talk to you about. I, th- I think one of the things is, is that HSP, I suck at lying. <laughs> Unless I have a plan and a story, I just cannot lie. And so I think what I'm going to talk about is I'm planning the surprise retirement party from my husband. And a couple of things have happened. <laughs> I just, I haven't known what to do. I ordered some shirts for him to give him as a gift at the party. And I knew they were arriving. And I guess I just hoped that I'd be able to intercept them when they were delivered and he wouldn't, <laughs> that they wouldn't be delivered. And he asked me what it was. And we were watching TV on Friday evening and the package got here and he ended up getting it. And he's like, what is this? I'm like, uh. <laughs> So my witty response was, I don't remember. And then I texted my son, Josh, to say like, hey, I, I don't know what to do. I, and I explained what had happened because both boys are coming down midweek because they tend to work on the weekend. So the party's in the middle of the week. And Josh FaceTimed me. And I'm sitting with my husband, so it's not like I can say anything. Fortunately, Steve couldn't see Josh's face and Josh mouthed like, are you with dad? And I'm like, yeah. So then we had to make up a conversation. This was the second call that we had that day. And normally when the boys call one of us, we just put it on speakerphone and we talk to them. But Josh had called earlier in the day and I went in the other room and I didn't put it on speakerphone. So I'm sure Steve, you know, I'm sure that he knows that something is going on. So we really weren't able to address what to do. I texted Josh's girlfriend because he was on his way over there. And I said, please remind Josh, you know, to text me when he gets there. So Josh texts me. He says, just tell dad that it's something for the, because it's Steve's birthday, the boys' birthdays are all in May. And so Josh says, just tell dad that it's something that you got for us boys. (laughs) And I had to tell Josh, I never buy you boys presents. Steve is the one that is usually, once the boys got older, as a mom, I cannot pick out gifts from my kids. They would hate them. So Steve is usually in charge of the gifts because he's just more in tune with them. So I had to say, I don't buy you by boys' presents. So Josh said, just tell dad it's something for his birthday. So I just set the package aside. And one what we were watching was over. Steve never said anything about it. And I was sure that he knew about it. There were a couple of other things that were doing this marinade for the chicken. And I got the recipe from a neighbor. And one of the things that I needed was Vietnamese fish sauce, which obviously we don't have in the house because I hardly cook. And Steve had gone to the commissary and I asked him to get it. But this was before we had talked about the the ruse is that the boys are throwing a surprise party for a kid that they went through all of school with. And my kids were fortunate enough to go through school with the same group of kids from kindergarten through high school. Because they played baseball, we've watched these kids grow up. Our house was the house that the kids came to. So we love these kids. So the ruse is that Daniel's coming down for this party. And then we said that Josh couldn't get the time off. And then Josh said he was able to get the time off because it wouldn't make sense why they'd both be coming down in the middle of the week for a day. So Steve had gone to the store and I asked him to look for the fish sauce. And this was before we planned the party. And so on Saturday, I went paddling and I texted Daniel because I just was concerned that Steve was suspecting things because I was acting weird when Josh called and then the thing with the package. So I said, talk to dad about this stuff. I said, do not mention the Vietnamese fish sauce. And so Daniel calls me after I paddle. I'm having lunch with my friends. And he says, I talked to dad about the Vietnamese fish sauce. And I'm like, I asked you not to. He said, no, dad said, oh, that's why she wanted me to get it. And again, as a highly sensitive person, this isn't true for everybody. 
For me, I remember details and putting pieces together. I think I'd be very hard if somebody tried to throw a surprise party for me because I catch details. And if that was me, I would have thought, wait, you asked me to get that before we even talked about the party, but my husband does not process that way, so it worked out fine. Steve has told me how excited he is to see these kids. I told Daniel to tell Steve about the kids that are coming to the party. Uh, We were shopping at the commissary yesterday, and Steve wanted to get soda. And I'm thinking, we're having a bunch of adults. This is his retirement party, so we want to get something a little bit more sophisticated than soda. But Steve decides to pick up the phone in the commissary and call Daniel to ask him what kind of drinks to get. Daniel did such a beautiful job of handling it. So he threw out a couple things, and then he asked me what I thought. And I said, you know, I was thinking maybe the kids would want something a little bit more sophisticated than soda, and this is what we were thinking about. And he said, yeah, that sounds great. (laughs) And then Steve and I were walking the dogs the other night, and he's like, you know what? I don't know why they're just not doing pizza or hot dogs so or hamburgers. So Steve called Daniel and said, is there any way that we told him it's Chandler's birthday party? Chandler's the one who lovingly nicknamed Josh, Joshica. And so he's like, are you sure you don't want to do pizza or burgers? (laughs) So again, Daniel handled it really well. So I think we're okay. It's <laughs> it's just been really challenging. And then after I paddled on Saturday, I needed to go order the cake and I needed to go to Party City to get some of the decorations for Steve's party. But Steve tracks me on my phone. We track each other and often he'll check to see where I'm at. So I disabled the tracker because I didn't want him to ask where I was going or why I was there. And I went to Party City and I put the stuff for the party in a shopping bag, not a party city bag, but in the back of my trunk and just left it there. And then we had to go to the commissary the next day. So I popped the trunk before we left because we were taking my car to fill it up. And we normally take the van. We don't take my little car shopping. And I didn't want him to see the bag. I also have a folding chair that has a little side table that pops up and it's already wonky. And if you put heavy stuff on it, it just doesn't work. So I said to Steve, let's put the groceries in the back seat and not in the trunk. And we went shopping. We normally do shopping for my mom and for us, and her shopping is much smaller. So Steve goes to the bigger line, and I go to the, you know, the 14 items or less checkout. But on this day, this was the only lane that was open for me. And so Steve gets through the entire line, and I text him and say, I'm still in line. He goes, that's fine. I'm going to the van. And I texted him back and said, we have the car. I have the keys. Do you want them? So I gave Steve the keys, and when I come out to the car, he's got all the groceries loaded up in the trunk. (laughs) So he did not see the bag that had the party supplies in it, and I didn't want stuff on my chair. And so I was grumpy, and then he felt bad, and then I felt bad that I was grumpy, but I couldn't say anything to him. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) these are the things that have been going on. And then I picked up some balloons. A neighbor of ours does these beautiful balloon arches, so I picked up the balloons, but she lives down the street. So if I came home and pulled up to her house, especially with this 15 and a half foot kayak on my car and he happened to be outside, he would be wondering, what am I doing down at their house? So I drove to another neighbor's house that lives on another block and called her and said, is it okay? Can I drop the balloons off at your house? And when you walk your dog, can you drop them off at this neighbor's house? (laughs) So it's been quite elaborate with all of the little ins and outs of this planning. and, And I am not a good liar. And Many of us HSPs are not very good at lying, you know, in the moment. It's funny, Steve and I are watching this show called In the Dark on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's about this woman who's blind and they get into drug trafficking and all kinds of stuff. But I'll tell you, this woman can lie on the spot. In this show, people can just lie on the spot, and I'm, I'm kind of amazed with it. The other thing I want to talk to you about is... You know, I shared with you back in October when I got my sit-in kayak. So the topic, Steve and I have done this recently. So the topic is returning anxiety and how do you manage it? For the first at least three, three and a half months when I got the new sit-in kayak, I really struggled with my anxiety of going in the channel, going out to the ocean. I was sure I was going to tip over. I was sure I was going to fall out. I was sure I was going to drown. I was sure I wouldn't be able to get back in my kayak. And then after a little over three months, all of a sudden it went away and I was really, really comfortable and I was so grateful for that. Jen has been talking with her clients about how I got over that anxiety, got over my seasickness. I still get a little seasick sometimes, but it seems to be pretty manageable. Sometimes I've had to say like, hey, I'm about ready to turn back, but I know if I get seasick that I can manage. I paddled for an hour and 20 minutes out in the ocean at Dana Point being seasick and I manage. So I know that I can get through it. 
But it's interesting. I did a downtown paddle on Saturday with a group of people. It was gorgeous. We launched from Coronado and paddled across the bay and then down through Seaport Village. And it was so great. We could go under the little, oh, Je- Brenda and I talked about what they're called today. And of course, I can't remember. If you dock your boats and the little bridge that you walk over to get down to your boats. We paddled under those. There were lots of places where there were chains. We paddled under a bunch of restaurants because they're on pylons and the water level was low enough that we could do it. It just was really fun. So it was just rougher than I'd expected. Brenda was out of town on Monday, so I didn't paddle. Tuesday night, I texted her to see if she was going to paddle Wednesday morning. I had a rough week. I just was not feeling it. And she wasn't able to paddle. And I said, I need an emotional support kayaker. And she said, I'm happy to be that for you, but I can't be that for you tomorrow. But what I love is that I feel comfortable enough with Brenda to let her know when I'm struggling and I'm having a hard time. And we did paddle this morning. We snuck out to the ocean and was there for a little bit. We were going to paddle down to Ocean Beach Pier, but she suggested we go back to the bay. But what I'm finding is I'm having a little bit more anxiety around being in the channel, being around the water when it's rougher. And I was paddling with someone on Saturday. If you follow me on social media, I have a yellow bilge pump and a yellow float bag that I used to keep on the front of my boat, but I wanted to clear it off. So I've been keeping it behind my boat. It's called a cowboy. I I don't know, the cowboy. If you fall out of your kayak, you kind of straddle the back of your kayak like it's a horse to get on it to get back in. And this paddler was telling me that you really want the stuff on the back of your boat to be cleared off because you don't want to have to crawl over it. And I've started to be more mindful about what I keep in my vest, my life jacket, you know, thinking about safety, just kind of trying to be forward thinking. So this morning I moved everything from the back of my boat to the front of my boat because part of it is prudent to think about that. But even going out the channel today, it was rough and rocky and What I know is when we work through anxiety over things, sometimes that anxiety comes back and it means that I'm going to have to start challenging myself. Well, my choice is I don't have to challenge myself and then I'm going to get fearful and then it's going to limit what I'm able to do. What I noticed is that the level of the charge was much, much less. I felt more uncomfortable in the channel today. I felt more uncomfortable being on the ocean And it was manageable, and I just kind of talked myself through it internally. I didn't need to talk to myself out loud. But knowing that the anxiety is kind of starting to come back again because I haven't been doing it, and so I want the freedom to be on the other side of this. I don't want my fear to dictate how I feel and what I do, so it means I'm going to have to start doing things that make me uncomfortable again. We talk about staying within that window of tolerance where we're comfortable and not too aroused, and maybe we push it just a little bit. We all get to decide. And and when Brenda and I were talking about the ocean today, she said, you know, today was a day for me where she didn't want to push it and paddle in the ocean. She wanted to stay in the bay. I totally get it. I really respect that. And one of the things that I appreciate is I've talked to you about having this goal of paddling 60 miles a month, which means basically each paddle is five miles, so I do 15 miles a week. Well, I lost last Monday and Wednesday. Saturday, I think we paddled 7.6 miles. And today I forgot to start my tracker when we started out. So we were probably about a mile in when I started it. And it means having to be flexible. What if I don't meet my 60 miles this month? Can I be okay with that? What if the paddle is shorter? Can I be okay with that? And even though I'd like to make these milestones, I'm really practicing on letting it be okay that I didn't. And kind of related to that is, you know, I've been talking for a while about how stressful these last couple months have been, how I've been out of balance. I'm doing my best to do the things that I can to stay in balance, but I really resist taking time off. And so (laughs) the universe is creating time off for me. I have clients canceling. I've got some openings in my schedule that I don't normally have, but it's allowing me that spaciousness. And I feel like because I wasn't willing to take that time off to help myself recover, the universe is creating the space that I need for me. And I, I really want to get back to a place where I'm feeling, it's like where my gas tank is full. I have enough gas to drive and to do the things that I need to do, but it feels like the gas tank goes down to empty when I'm done. And it just takes time for it to fill back up. And I'm sharing this with you because I'm seeing that a lot of people are really struggling right now. And if you're struggling, provided you're not suicidal, it's not extreme, but you're managing, but it's hard, that it's okay. 
And what are the things that you need to create more spaciousness in your schedule if you need help? I know that the theme for me the last couple months has been around needs and having competing needs. And then when I get very stressed, I feel like I get very what I call contracted. I don't want to have needs. I don't want to ask for things. I don't want to have wants. And I order some skincare products from a friend of mine who sells something that, you know, you have to order online and she's the distributor. And I reached out to her because I needed to place an order and I had some questions. And she said, you know, I can order it for you if you want, but she's very busy too. And she's someone I've known for many years. She's also a therapist. And I just said, I don't want to have wants and needs. Like I'll take care of it, but I don't want to have wants and needs. And she had said, it's so much easier to help somebody else when they're struggling with things than to take care of our own stuff. So again, I just want to normalize that if you're having that thing of you don't want to ask for help, you don't want to have wants and needs, it's easier to help other people with their stuff than to focus on your own stuff. Like, it's okay and it's normal. I've been talking about, now that Steve is retired, how we're trying to get some of the clutter cleaned up in the house, which I really want. I, if things have a place, I do much better about just putting things back in their place. And there is a sense of satisfaction of when we have routines and we follow them and we complete them, it's esteeming. It feels good. So we're really working on trying to get things cleaned up in the house, but un- <laughs> I guess he's okay with it. I was going to say, unfortunately, Steve has to initiate most of it, but he's very tasky. Like he likes to get stuff done. He likes puttering. He likes doing errands. He likes doing those things. And I think with the work that I'm doing, I just, I have the bandwidth to do the things that I need to do for my work and for the podcast and the puppy and training. And that's about all that I have the bandwidth for. And I guess the third thing I want to talk about, and I'm a little reluctant to talk about this, Jen and I talked about talking about it when we recorded earlier today, is this idea of having expectations. Like we got this puppy, Maisie, and I love her. So I'm, I'm going to give you the bottom line. We are going to keep her. I love her. And... I apparently had some expectations about what she would be like. And when we met her, she was cuddly and affectionate. I'm very, very tactile. I really, touching things, having soft things around me is really, really important. So she's got this wire hair fur. And as she's matured, her hair has gotten much more wiry. And she's not super affectionate with me. She's not the type of dog that comes up and uses her muzzle to kind of nudge under your hand to be pet. She won't sit with me. I get my hair cut by a neighbor and I was walking home and Steve was walking Maisie and one of our neighbors has a relative that was visiting and the dogs play together. And so she was sitting cross-legged on the ground because Steve was walking the dogs and Maisie was cuddled up in her lap just cuddling with her. And when Josh comes, he sits on the love seat and she jumps up and cuddles him. She will not get on the love seat with me. That night we were watching TV and I got on the floor and I sat down cross-legged and invited her over. She wouldn't come. (laughs) I'm feeling very needy and I'm feeling very rejected by my dog. What I have to say is She's totally house trained. I take her to Dog Beach. I take her to Dog Park. She's not on a leash. She listens to me. She is very well behaved. She's really an amazing and attentive dog. And when I paddle and come home, she's happy to see me. So it's not that that there's anything fundamentally wrong with her. They've shown with studies in epigenetics that like you can train a rat to be afraid of a bell or afraid of the color blue, and three generations of rats will be afraid of that same thing. And I suspect that someone in her lineage was a homeless dog because there is something. We'll be at the beach and she'll go over to a person, kind of crouch down low with that waggly hello, and then they reach down to pet her and then she bolts off. And even today I'm recording, so I went to take off her collar and she's the type of dog that prefers to be naked. So it's a challenge getting her to put her harness on. After I take her collar off, she doesn't want me to put it back on. We go to go for a walk and I pick out the harness and she runs into the kitchen. We've done this enough times, so I just go to the door. Sometimes I've left and then she knows to go to the door and then she crouches down with her head low like I'm going to beat her. I don't yell at her. I don't beat her. I've (laughs) I've been unusually kind and patient with her. And then she kind of submits and lets me put her harness on. We are switching to a different kind that's less restrictive that will just slip over her head and be less cumbersome. But, you know, all these little things are just like, I don't understand. And probably because Gracie is so easy and has to be on my lap most of the time glued to me, it's just been an adjustment. And we're going to keep her and I'm committed to it. And she may change as she grows, but it's just, (laughs) it's 
been hard. And I feel a little bit embarrassed saying like, I, I want a dog that like wants to be close to me and wants to sit with me and wants to cuddle with me. And she will come up on the bed sometimes. But if I sleep in Daniel's room, which I've done when I'm not feeling well, she'll sleep on the bed with me. But if Steve and I are in bed together, then she's gone back to sleeping in her crate. So I did get some dog beds for the bedroom floor. And we're going to see if she'd rather have a comfortable dog bed on the floor. But I bring this up to you because I don't think we talk about this very much. And Jen and I were talking, we didn't record about it, but she has a puppy who's gotten into stuff, destroyed stuff, destructed stuff. It happens when you have children. It's not that you're going to send them back, but being in a relationship, working, all of these things are hard and they come with challenges. And I don't think that we're given permission to talk about the challenges and how it's hard. And sometimes we think about what would it be like if I wasn't with this partner? What would it be like if I didn't have kids? What would it be like if I had a dog that came to me and loved me and sat in my lap and had soft fur? That those things are okay, but I think our society jumps on us and we feel like it's not okay to express some of the fantasies and wishes and desires that we have. And it's okay. So are there things that you're feeling uncomfortable with? Do you need to set boundaries? Do you need to make changes? Do you just need a place to voice what is not feeling comfortable for you? Because all feelings are okay. So for me, here's the balance, that I need to not be talking about this all the time until I convince myself that my dog is not affectionate and doesn't love me. Because she does. She's very bonded to me. She's very responsive to me. And she just is a little bit more independent than I would prefer. It's my job to focus on what are the things that she has that I like that work for me. Because if I continue to tell this story about, you know, she's aloof and she doesn't love me and she's not affectionate, that is what I'm going to see in my dog and only that. And I will create a distant and strained relationship with her. It's my job to be able to hold both of those things together and to focus on, you know, she's really an amazing dog. For being five months old, she's really an amazing dog. So how do you honor your feelings without creating a whole story around them that overshadows everything else? Because we need to be able to do both of those things and honor ourselves, honor our feelings, and not create this false narrative that gets bigger and overshadows what the truth is. I hope that makes sense. I think that's pretty much all that I have. I've kind of talked about a bunch of random stuff today, but it feels like there have been salient points in each one that are relatable. That's my hope. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think that's pretty much it. At this point, I do have a couple spots open if you're interested in working with me. I've switched to a coaching model, which just gives me so much freedom to work with people in a way that feels authentic and genuine. We can still work on your history. We can still work on wounding. There's just a framework that works under coaching that feels just more authentic and genuine. A lot of people are not sure when they reach out for a consult, you know, what's the difference between therapy and coaching? I'm more than happy to discuss that with you. We can talk about relationships and boundaries. If you have questions about being highly sensitive, how do we work with our wounding? How do we create the lifestyle that we want? How do we work with our anxiety and depression? How do we thrive as an HSP? How do we deal with social things and things that make us uncomfortable and all of that stuff? So, if you're interested in working with me, you can reach out to me at unapologeticallysensitive.com. If you have reached out to me in the past for a consult and you didn't hear back from me, please check your spam folders. I can't tell you how many times I respond to people and I never hear back and I don't know if people have moved on. I try and be prompt as I can. Please check your spam or junk folders because I do respond to people and I never know what to do. I don't want to bug people, but I do respond. All right. I hope you are doing well. I hope you are feeling some peace. It's okay if things are hard. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day.